Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to Misinformation in Science and Society. Here to listen, not to judge. I'm your host, Annie, and today with us we have Asha Rangappa. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Um, so let's just get started. So could you please like introduce yourself a little bit and uh what you do? Yeah, um, my name is Asha Rangappa. I am a senior lecturer and assistant dean at Yale's Jackson School of Global Affairs. Mm-hmm. Uh, before that, I was an associate dean at Yale Law School. And before that, I was an FBI special agent. Yeah, um, so I know you've like done a lot of stuff. So like, why did you choose to like do like some of the things that you did? Because I think it's like really cool. And a lot of them are like related but like also like somewhat different so I just wanted to like hear kind of like the story yeah no they're totally different you know um I feel like I always went down a path of something that I wanted to do or that I was passionate about and then Mm -hmm. an opportunity kind of would come up that I had not expected and um, I took advantage of those opportunities so um I applied to law I applied to the FBI when I was in law school Mm -hmm. Uh, My goal was to become a federal prosecutor, and what I thought I would do is do criminal investigations in the FBI and then move over to becoming a prosecutor, which are very related, Mm -hmm. Um, and that was sort of the plan. Um, By the time I got into the FBI, though, it was right after 9-11, and so I got put into the counterintelligence division, which is very different than criminal investigations. The counterintelligence division monitors foreign intelligence activity in the United States. So uh, they're basically catching spies. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was doing a lot of you know, highly classified investigations, things that really don't see the inside of a courtroom. Um, and all of that really informs probably some of what we're going to talk about today, but things that I talk about on TV. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, I came back to, I graduated from Yale Law School, um, and I decided to make a transition to academia because of personal things that I want, you know, I wanted to start a family, and, and that was a little bit mm-hmm. harder to do in the FBI in New York City. So um, I got the opportunity, I applied to be the Dean of Admissions at Yale Law School, and um, got the job. So I, I decided to do that, uh, and it was very exciting because, you know, it's not something I planned on. And that's kept me in academia. And now I've moved into Yale's new global affairs school, uh, where I also teach uh, national security law and courses related to disinformation, information warfare, and those types of things. And then I comment also on television, uh, on legal and national security issues. Yeah, that's that's awesome. That's really cool. Um, So just one more question before I get into like the misinformation stuff. Um, What's like your favorite part of like doing what you do now? My favorite part of doing what I do now is explaining things, new things and concepts to people and helping them understand complicated issues, Mm -hmm. Um, especially things that affect our day-to-day lives, like things that are in the news, you know, and we have so much information coming at us. Uh, these days that I like to think of myself almost as a translator, um, Mm -hmm. where I can use some of my background and expertise, whether it's in law or national security, to explain things to lay people. Um, And I know that when I'm on the other end for things that I don't know, like during COVID, I loved hearing from doctors because it was just something that I didn't know. So I think that that translation function in today's um, information saturated environment Mm -hmm. um is really important and that's what I enjoy doing yeah that's great so um uh so like could you tell could you talk a little bit about like the misinformation in like the different um things that you've done uh I'm sure they're like different and um like for example like for like FBI and then for like law and then like public affairs like could you tell me a little bit about like the misinformation in those and like Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, when I was in the FBI, like I said, I monitored foreign intelligence uh, Mm -hmm. services. So these were spies that other countries were sending to the U.S. And many of them would be engaging in 
operations to influence the opinions and attitudes of people inside this country on various issues. Um, the FBI calls those perception management operations. So they're trying to, you know, they're trying to affect people's perception of, you know, whatever issues, topics, things like that, policy stuff usually um, yeah. that would benefit that country. So um, those were, you know, often political uh, issues and policy issues. Um, it, with the law, you know, I think right now we're in a little bit of a crisis in terms of misinformation uh, and disinformation um, around really, you know, the application of the law um, and the principles behind the rule of law in the United States. You know, we have people who call investigation, say, into January 6th. Um, you know, a hoax or being politically motivated. And what's that, what that's doing is it's undermining trust in our institutions and specifically mm -hmm. in, you know, our federal law enforcement and uh, the Department of Justice. Um, and, you know, we have mechanisms to try to counter that. Uh, as we're speaking, the day that we're talking about this right now, the Department of Justice just appointed a special counsel to investigate some of these things mm -hmm. um, as a way of creating independence and a perception of, to shore up people's uh, faith in that. But I think that it's a real challenge in that area. Misinformation is a real challenge right now because it does undermine that institution. Um, and in global affairs, you know, I mean, we have seen just with the global pandemic, how much misinformation there was about COVID-19 to the point where, you know, people really had um, erroneous views about the efficacy of the vaccine or even in believing whether COVID was real. Um, so I think that it really does pervade and impact every different area, certainly every different area that I have been involved with. Yeah. For sure, yeah. I think it's it's like the misinformation, like the disinformation, like spreading misinformation like on purpose. Um, also, like I, I like how you mentioned about the pandemic. Like I just um came back from the UN like COP twenty seven, and I talked to like a lot of people about like people spreading like wrong information about like climate change on purpose because they don't mm -hmm. believe them. Yeah, it's like hard for like change to happen if like, um people like don't like agree on the same like basis like foundation kind of thing I think yeah I mean I think that's exactly right and you know at least for d a democracy and for democratic processes mm -hmm. right you have to have a shared set of facts that you're starting from um, that is just you know without that you can't debate you can't have a meaningful debate if you're not agreeing on the facts that you have different opinions or views on. And we're in a little bit of a crisis here because you're exactly right. When you can actually divide people and have them inhabit completely separate realities, mm -hmm. you're essentially taking away a fundamental democratic pillar, mm -hmm. um, which is just consensus about the facts, consensus about just the ground rules, you know? Um, like when there's when there's misinformation, disinformation about an election um, mm -hmm. and what happened, you're eroding the ground rules of how, you know, like we agree we're going to do, you know, we're going to have elections, we're going to allow people to count the votes, and we're going to agree that whoever wins, wins, and whoever lost, lost. Mm -hmm. When people throw that out the window, you know, you really can't have the same kind of functioning democracy anymore. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so do you think misinformation is like a particularly like huge issue right now I know you kind of like mentioned it with like law and stuff but um like if so like do you think like social media plays a part in that or like anything like that yeah I mean look you know misinformation and disinformation has been around forever mm -hmm. um you know this is uh, it, in fact you know disinformation um it has been a military tactic for a long time, uh, mm -hmm. that type of deception. It's a, it's a way of achieving strategic goals. Mm -hmm. um, I think what is different now is one, as you mentioned, the internet and social media make the reach and proliferation, the amplification of, mm -hmm. of these things, misinformation, disinformation, 
exponentially greater than they ever were before. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So something that would have required, you know, someone reading it in a newspaper and then passing it on to someone else and then mentioning it on a TV show, you know, it, it was a much slower process before and certainly before these, te you know, t television and radio was super slow. Mm -hmm. um, now you just have to drop it into a TikTok video and it's going to be seen by, you know, potentially hundreds of thousands of people. And so um, that makes it very hard to combat um, because there's just so much of it. Um, the other thing I think that's different now is, you know, I mentioned before that it's, it's, this is not new as, for example, a military tactic. Um, but now the targets are civilians, right? Mm -hmm. Like when Russia, for example, is engaging in influence operations and, um, spreading disinformation, they are doing it, you know, in some kind of, uh, military confrontation with our military. They are targeting actual citizens in the United States. They are seeking to divide and, and sow chaos and undermine our institutions and make people lose faith in uh, democracy, in our free press. And so, you know, that makes it very dangerous because it's no longer confined in this space Um you know, a, a kind of a state to state type of action. It's now uh, we're we're all targets. You know, we're all victims, and so we have to know what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I know you talked about like institutions doing things to like help fight mis uh, misinformation uh, with a newly elected um, person. So, what do you think, like, like regular people, like, um, what do you think like, we can do to like help fight? or like avoid or like tackle this information? Yeah, well, the key with misinformation and disinformation is that it works when people are unwitting, right? When they don't understand what's being done. And so um, I, there's probably too much to go into now in, in our brief interview, but I think things like media literacy, so really understanding um, the information that you're consuming the sources where you're getting your information, um, whether they're reliable sources, when you get something that you're not sure of where it's coming from, like you see a video and, you know, it's, you know, let's, uh, whatever, it's something that is really provocative, um, you know, do you really know where it's coming from? Like it could be from some other place that's being presented to you as something that it's not. Um, mm -hmm. So getting people to be savvier about their digital and media literacy. Mm -hmm. um, I think also um, civic literacy. So mm -hmm. particularly when it comes to institutions, people, um, you know, bad actors are taking advantage of the fact that people don't understand how our institutions and how our democracy works. The reason that election misinformation um, and conspiracies can spread is because people don't understand, for mm -hmm. example, that, you know, it might take a long time to count votes when they come through the mail. Um, mm -hmm. You may not have a winner on election night. That's normal. That actually means that every vote is being counted. Mm -hmm. But if people don't understand that, and if they're being told, no, you know, that means that you know, votes are being burned in the backyard or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. That's how these kinds of conspiracies can take place. So civic literacy, really educating people on how um, our democracy works is very important. And the last thing I think that doesn't really get talked about, but is something that I teach in my class is social trust. Um, mm -hmm. Social trust is sort of the trust that we have in each other as fellow citizens, um, even when we don't know each other. And when we have trust in each other, um, it becomes harder to divide us, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's harder to exploit divisions um, if we have a general sense of goodwill towards um, other people that we live with. Um, you know, social media divides us into little bubbles and it becomes easier for us to think of our own tribes, whether it's our political tribe or our religious tribe or whatever it is. And so I think, you know, one thing that we can do is, and, and this is a challenge to me, so I'm not even saying this as a, you know, in a luxury way, but to really get offline and get out and um, connect with people in meaningful ways 
so to so as to build those bonds that we have, those human bonds that we have that I think we've really lost um, mm -hmm. through the internet age and social media, and then definitely during the pandemic as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, would you say that's like important to be like paired with like critical thinking still to like make sure? Mm -hmm. yeah. For sure. All, I mean, all of these, like all of the above. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, here's the thing, Annie, is that, you know, there are things that we can do to counter disinformation. Um, and we should do that, you know, things like fact checking and, um, you know, tweaks to social media and, and uh, you know, account cyber operations against, you know, Russian troll farms or whatever. But I think we're in an age where it's here to stay, like we can kind of manage it and, and counter it in those ways. But we also need to learn to be resilient. Mm -hmm. um, given that we're targets, we have to figure out how do you build resilience? Like with the pandemic, what do we do? We create a vaccine. Mm -hmm. right? We didn't say we got to like, we're just going to eradicate it somehow. Mm -hmm. um, we said, look, it's here what we need to do. Also, like we want to mitigate its spread, but we also want to make it so that if we do get infected, we're resilient, we don't get sick. And I think that disinformation and misinformation is the same way. Um, mm -hmm. You have to kind of work both ends of that. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So I, I know we don't have like too much time. Um, but so like, just like wrap this up, um, do you have like any like advice for people, especially teens? Um, it can be like about like information, like literally like, or like just like life advice, I guess, like anything. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, your generation especially is one that is a digital generation. I mean, this is what you know, and it feels like natural to you. Um, and I think maybe to part of the thinking critically is thinking critically about how you're using this technology and the role that it's playing in your life and understanding that right now you're the product i'm the product when we're mm -hmm. you know using these things and thinking about you know how our own choices create incentives for these companies to keep doing what they're doing Mm -hmm. And if anyone can swing the pendulum the other way, it's your generation, right? Because now you have the benefit of seeing some of the negative consequences of these amazing technologies and to correct for them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it kind of, it, in many ways, it's sort of like, you know, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, um, people smoked all the time. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was really bad for you then, um, but it just wasn't fully understood and people just kind of were very nonchalant about it. As we learn more, we've created more, um, you know, restrictions and we've also changed our attitudes around it. You know, um, we most people think that or they understand that it's not good for you. Mm -hmm. And so I think that um, understanding, you know, some of that and altering our own behavior is really important. And I think that that's something that particularly young people can keep in mind. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for that. And just thank you so much for, again, for like taking the time to um, have this conversation. That was like, I learned a lot and- Oh, good. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really um, glad that you invited me to be on. Thank you. I'm gonna stop the recording.